You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Word of the Lord. Jim's over here with you tonight. And we are so glad that you are with us. We hope that you were watching the uh, discussion between uh, Mark and uh, Mr. Johnson. And I hope that you could hear that and see that. And uh, what I heard was, was interesting. I want to leave, give our kind of information. If you'd like to have any questions about that program, you'd like a copy of it or this program, you can reach me at Word of the Lord at gmail.com, 276-340-2653. We meet at uh, 250 the Boulevard in uh, Eden. And uh, we hope that you'll come out and study God's Word with us on uh, uh, Thursday nights or Sundays. I am going to move this chair from behind me. Mark was sitting in it. It's not in my way, but it was in the picture. And uh, we hope that you will uh, take advantage of uh, the opportunity we have to study the Bible. This evening, I want you to think about uh, where you would sit if you were going to the Super Bowl. You know, Super Bowl this weekend, I believe, uh, uh, somewhere out in California. San Francisco, maybe. Uh, I don't know. But uh, not, not really keeping up with it. I know people probably cringing when they hear that. Here I am in North Carolina and not keeping up with what Super Bowl is, but... Well, I don't. <laughs> so, but nonetheless, I know that generally people, when they're going to the Super Bowl, they want, would want a good seat or maybe any kind of sporting event or any kind of, of uh, special assembly. You'd want a good seat. Well, what would you pay to get a good seat? You know, would you just walk up and get general admission or would you maybe pay a little extra for some uh, <clears throat> uh, seats on the 50-yard line or in the end zone or... or, or I don't know really where the best seat is uh, in, a, in a football stadium. Uh, or would you settle for the nosebleed section? You know, get way up high and uh, really where you just have to really look at it on the big screen jumbotron or something. Well, if you're going to the Super Bowl this year and you want to pay for a ticket, you're actually in, in uh, luck because I think prices are a little bit lower this year than they were last year. So you might get a discount if you're looking for a good seat. Uh, tickets for the match between the Denver Broncos and the Carolina Panthers are selling for an average price. And I'm going to say that, you know, this is a, a discount good deal price of $4,957. That's the average price. You get some a little lower than that, some a little higher than that. But the average price is right at $4,900. So, you know, hey, that may be a good deal if they're a little bit lower than they were last year. Uh, the most expensive tickets for Sunday's game so far were a pair of seats near the 50-yard line, which went for $20,500. Uh, they were sold to a San Jose resident. So somebody out in San Jose had <coughs> had uh, uh, $20,000 uh, to put down for good seats on the 50-yard line for this year's Super Bowl. Well... I don't know if you'd pay that for a good seat in the Super Bowl or not. Maybe you'd like to go, but you might not be willing to pay that. But what about this? If you were in the nosebleed section, let's say, and someone offered you the chance to move down to those 50-yard line tickets, those seats, those 50-yard line seats, would you, would you jump the chance to move if you could get to a, a better seat? You know, if you could move to a better seat, would you? I mean, would you say, well, you know, I'm going to get up and I'm going to kind of move on down uh, that's a better seat. I know <clears throat> sometimes people have uh, been known to go to their seats and found someone else sitting in their, in their seats because the people who were sitting there, you know, thought they were empty, and so they moved down to get into the good seats and maybe start a fight or something. I don't know. But if you had a chance to move to a better seat, would you? Well, the first thing I would do is I would find out where I was sitting. In other words, you may, you may already be in a pretty good seat, or you may, you know, you may say, well, I've been way up here in the nosebleed section. I do want to move on down. I want to get down close to the, to the field, close to the 50-yard uh, line, down there closer to the action. Well, what would you do if you could move? Well, the first thing you do is find out where you're sitting. You know what, friends, this is very much like what the Bible talks about when we're talking about sitting and getting in a good seat. You know, the Bible says we're sitting in a seat. We're in one seat or another. 
And what I'm going to tell you tonight is I'm going to tell you how to get to a better seat, how to move to a better seat. First of all, you need to find out where you're sitting. Now look at this. In Ephesians chapter 2, <clears throat> excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 uh, through 3, listen what, what Paul says about the seat that you're sitting in. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespass and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, uh, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. All right, now verse 3. He says, Among whom also we, uh, uh, we all had our conversation in time past in the fruits of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, this is where we're sitting. This is where everybody is sitting. You are, you are in your sins. You are in trespassing sins. That's where you're sitting. Now, you say, well, James, that's said you're walking. Well, here's the fact. Friends, if you are not sitting in a good seat, you're sitting in sin. Now notice what the, the psalmist says. In Psalm 1 and verse 1, Psalm 1 and verse 1, the psalmist says, he says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of God, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So here's the thing. You say, well, I'm just, I may be walking among the sinners. Well, eventually you're going to be sitting there. That's where you find yourself. You are sitting outside of Christ, and you're sitting in sin. In the Bible, <clears throat> and the Bible is going to use that illustration uh, again and again to show exactly how God views mankind in his sin. For example, in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6, this is where you're living. 1 Timothy 5, verse 6, Paul says, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead in sins while she liveth. This is where you're, you're stationed in life. You are sitting in sin. That's your seat. Now, you may say, well, I've got a pretty good seat. But, friends, the, th the fact of the matter is, you could be in a whole lot better seat. You just think that the seat you're in is in a good seat. See, this is the way sin works. Sin get you to believe that the seat you're in is okay and really it does and it gets you not to move but i want you to consider this in uh john chapter 9 john chapter 9 <clears throat> and verse 39 john chapter 9 verse 39 now this is uh i'm gonna put the whole text up here John 9, 39. Jesus said, For judgment am I coming to this world that they which uh, see might which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. And some of them, and some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, Ye should have no sin, but now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Now, friends, this is exactly where people are today. You're sitting in sin. Your, your seat is, is that big, fluffy, comfortable, lazy boy chair of sin. And you just think you've got a good chair. You think you've got a good seat. You say, i got the best seat in the house. But the fact of the matter is, you're blind to the fact that you're in sin. There's a lot of people say, well, I read my Bible and I go to church. You know, I listen to Pastor Billy Bob Johnson down there every Sunday. He preaches right out of the Bible. But, friend, you're still in sin. You know why? Because you have determined where you are. You're just letting the preacher tell you you're saved. You're, giving, you're letting people convince you that because you are coming to church, you're going to worship God the way your mama, your daddy, your grandma, your grandpa always did, you think you're okay. But the fact of the matter is, you are sitting in sin. Now notice this. 
If you're blind to sin, if sin has blinded you, then you really don't know where you're sitting. Now that's the way the devil works. I want you to consider this. In first and second Corinthians, second Corinthians, chapter four, we're going to look at verse uh, three. Notice what Paul says. Paul says, "But if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded." the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, <coughs> should shine unto them. Now, friends, I submit to you that you are blinded to the gospel. Now, here's why I say that, friends, and I don't mean to, I'm not trying to get people all mad and they say you, you're just talking you know, hate speech or whatever, but here's a fact, friend. The majority of people in this world are either in a man-made church or they don't even believe in God at all, like, like the man that uh, Mark was having a discussion with. They think there is no God, and the rest, and the majority of them, uh, or the other part of them, think that there is a God, and they think that they're worshiping Him, and they never even sought to find if what they believe is really in the Bible. So the God of this world has blinded their minds to the gospel to the point that even if they heard the gospel and saw the gospel, and there's been times, friends, when we actually put the scriptures up on screen and people won't even read it because they think or because they realize if they do read it, it's going to change what they believe. It's going to <clears throat> make them uh, see that what they've been saying is wrong so they don't even read it. Now, friends, that's blinded to the gospel. And if you're blinded to the gospel, you're sitting in sin. Because the gospel is what's going to shine the light so that, that you can come to Christ. It's going to direct your path. The psalmist said that uh, the, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So if you're going to come to the Father, you're going to have to have the light of the gospel shining to direct you. If you want to be directed by the gospel, guess what? It must be because you're blind. You're blind to the truth. Now, in Matthew 5 and verse 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God. Now, friends, if you are not pure in heart to the point that you're willing to say, You know what? I, I, I could be wrong. If you're not pure in heart to the point that you're saying, You know what? I can't find what I believe in the Bible. And therefore, I am wrong. Friend, if you can't find what you believe in the Bible, why is it that you still think that you're right? See, if you can't have, if you don't have the evidence to prove, why? What makes you think you're right? The 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 guy Mark was talking with kept saying, "Well, there, there's ample proof of evolution. Oh, there's a bunch of proof. Just go down to the museum. Well, give some examples of the proof. Get oh, it's out there, all right." Boy, if I had a dollar every time I heard someone say that about proof, give me some proof. Give me some evidence. Prove it. If the church you're in, my friend, if it's in the Bible, prove it. Just turn to the page and find it. Show that what you do and what you practice is in accordance with the Scripture. You, know, you say, well, I'm in the church of God. I know what's in the Bible. Okay, you got the name right. Let's see, if, let's see if everything else is right. Do you have women preachers? Well, yeah. Well, that's wrong. Yeah, you have one pastor? Yeah, well, that's wrong. See that? So there's a, there's a number of things that you can start checking off. Say, well, you must not really be the church of God in the Bible. You got mechanical instruments of music? Yeah, well, that's another thing's wrong. See, friends, you got to prove it. Otherwise, you're blinded to the truth. But if you really want to see God... You're going to have to be pure in heart. You're going to have to be pure in heart. That is to say, okay, I am going to humble myself. I'm going to look at God's word. And if it says I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. And if it tells me what I need to do, I'm going to do it. Otherwise, you're, you're blinded in sin. Let me ask you this, friends. How did you get to the sea you're in? So if you want to find out where you're sitting, 
If you can't find where you're sitting in the Bible, maybe you should ask yourself, well, how did I get there? How did I get to the seat? You know what, friends? I, I submit to you that, you know, your usher who got you to your seat, who pointed you to your seat, is the devil. He is the one that wants you to stay in that seat and not give up, not get up. In John 16, verse 11, Jesus said of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Satan is the prince of this world. And we read in uh, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, we read about uh, the prince of this world. Remember this? Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that I work within the children of disobedience. In Colossians chapter 1, in verse 1, Colossians 1 and verse 1, <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossia, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which we have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up, in, uh, laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is to all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Verse 7. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. I just realized that that, that, is, that should be Colossians 3. That's a, good, that's a good scripture, 3. But we need to go to Colossians 3. That's what I was looking for. Sorry about that. I just want to see if y'all pay attention. All right, Colossians 3. Verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek the things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. You're not sitting with Christ. You must be sitting somewhere else. But your affection, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, uh, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things say the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Now, friend, who put you there? Who directed you to walk in all of these sins? Who directed you to walk in fornication and lasciviousness and covetousness? Wasn't God. Wasn't the Bible. Yet there's many times that most of the people that are in the religious world, they think it's okay to do all these things. Okay to gamble, okay to drink, okay to dance and go out and carouse around because once saved, always saved. Hey, you know, boy, life's good. No, Satan's got you in a seat and he's got you believing it's a good seat. You're sitting in sin. You're sitting bound in sin and, and Satan puts you in that chair and now he makes you think that you're in a good seat. And that's exactly what he wants. He wants you to think you have a good seat. And really what it does, he has, he has gotten you to believe that you're in a good seat and that you can't leave. Now notice this. In James 1 and verse 13. James 1 and verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. 
For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Now, friend, how is it that you think Giving your life over to the bottle, the drugs, fornication. How is it you think that that's a good seat? Sitting in that life is a good seat. Now, there's, there's a lot of individuals today that are being told that you need to give in to pleasure. You need to give in to self-indulgence. And uh, because that's just, you know, that, that's good. You know, eat, drink, and be merry, or tomorrow we'll die. Now, that's what the atheist will say. The atheist that used to be on here was Larry Serbert. You know, that's what he said. Oh, yeah, just, you know, do whatever feels good. Now, that's the devil talking. That's the devil ushering you to a seat. Because he knows that if he gets you to give in to sin and to live in sin... <clears throat> You'll stay in your seat. You'll stay in your seat. You know how I know that? Because, friends, that's the nature of sin. That, and the, the devil knows that's his tool. Sin is pleasurable. Sin is pleasurable. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25. Go ahead and put the phone lines up, Matt, if you want to. Talking about, they were talking about uh, 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 Moses here, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin is pleasurable. Don't let anybody tell you it's not. Really, when he gets right down to it, sin is a an overreaching of pleasures or things that God has. Said are okay. It's just that the devil gets you to go beyond that. See, there's nothing wrong with uh, there's nothing wrong with the pleasures of sexual relations as long as it's within the bounds of marriage between an eligible man and woman. The devil comes along and says, "Oh no, no, it could be with two men or two women, or it can be with uh, someone you're not married to, someone else's wife, someone else's husband." See, sin gets you to go beyond that. See, nothing wrong with having food to eat, right? The devil comes along and says, well, but what you need to do is you need to, to steal. The devil gets you to take those desires and goes an extra mile. And in doing that, he's bound you to your seat. He's bound you to your seat. He's keeping you where he wants you. That's what he's doing. See, all this, these natural desires, that, that's what Satan's playing on. He's counting on you taking these natural desires a bit further. That's why, look at this, in 1 John 2 and verse 15. 1 John 2 and verse 15. John says, Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So these natural desires, Satan says, I'm going to get these, this man, this woman, I'm going to get them to try to just constantly be gratifying themselves, and sin will get them. Friends, it's called, we call it addiction, Right? We call it addiction. The drug addict takes a drug, he gets a buzz, gets a high, feels good, and then he's got to have a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Because the highs are harder to come by, so he gets a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. The alcoholic, same way. Any kind of addict. Any, anything that is in control of you, that's what it does. Now, friends, that's, that's putting you in your seat. That's putting you in your seat. And once you get in that seat, sin makes you stay there. 
And really, it's a lot like folks. You say, well, you may say, well, well, James, I don't do all those things. I, I'm not a fornicator. I don't run around with my wife, and you know, I've been faithful to her uh, all this time, and I don't cheat. I don't steal. I, I, you know, I'm, I I obey the laws of the land. I, I don't even drink, don't gamble, anything like that. But watch this, friends. Are you in a church that's not in the Bible? Are you in the Methodist church? Yeah, I'm in the Methodist church. been in the Methodist church 30, 40 years. Why? It's not in the Bible. You know why you're there? You know why you're there? The same reason the crackhead's out there looking for another score. Same reason why the, 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 the meth head is out here trying to get a fix. Why? Because sin's got him there. Got him in his seat. And he can't get out of it. And you are in a church that's not in the Bible. And you basically are addicted to that church. You're saying, oh, I, I can't leave. You know, I was actually talking to a, to a lady one time. <clears throat> she was in the Christian church. I haven't seen her in a good while. I don't even know uh, uh, if maybe she's still in contact with some folks. But she told me, she said, the reason why she's in the Christian church is if she left, it would hurt her mother. Friends, you see how the devil works? He gets you in a seat and makes you stay there. You're on the word of the Lord. Hello, Mark. How are you? This is James, but I'm fine. I meant James. I'm sorry. That's all right. Don't tell Mark. Okay. Um, you are talking right to me. I sit in the recliner with my TV and my cigarette and my coffee and my potato chips or cheese noodles. I have my own bed. Uh, I eat just what I want to eat, sometimes not for three days, but I eat when I want to eat. And I am living in a bad seat. Okay. What about... How's your, uh, how's your, how's your, how are you sitting with God? That's really what, if, if we can figure out, if we can figure out how we're sitting with God, we can take care of a lot of the other things that we're sitting in. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So, uh, I think, I think I'm doing my will and not God's will, and I am being selfish um, there was another thing I was going to say about what I was. It's, um, well, just, just, I'm justifying my own self. That's okay. what I'm doing. Okay. I'm, I'm justifying, justifying my own habits and ways. And I know that everything is not right with what I do. But I've been smoking 46 years, and I am so addicted to cigarettes. Mm. Well. And I, and I drink about a pot and a half of coffee or two pots within 24 hours. And. Well, this is, this is what I was saying, ma'am, about this is why I asked about how are you sitting with God? How, how are you sitting in relationship with God? And, and because the reason why I say that is because when. A person's in a right relationship with God. This is kind of what we talked about in our Bible study tonight. The Paul said to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he talked about the word which effectively worketh in them. And so when you're in a right relationship with God and you're constantly studying God's word, it works on you. And it, keep, and it purifies a lot of the things that are in your life that don't need to be there. The addiction to cigarettes and things like that. God's word will help you get past that. So that's why I ask, how is your relationship with God? You know, are you are you a member of the Lord's church? Where do you where do you go to church? Uh, I haven't been but maybe three times in thirty six years. Okay. So I said, and one of those times one of those times was, was in the last few months to the Church of Christ on Stalin Avenue. Okay. All right. So are are you um are are you the lady that's you've had some Bible studies with, with uh, Micah and Caleb maybe? Just one time, yes, sir. Okay. 
So, see, ma'am, what I'm what I'm trying to get you to realize is one way to get out of all the the things you just described you you're sitting in is by first making a move to get right with God. We're, when we continue our study, we're going to talk about how to get into a better seat. That's what we're talking about. So, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> You know, if okay. can, can I can uh, you know I'd I'd love to study with you too, or you know we put you back in touch with uh, uh, the guys in Martinsville. I know they'll be able to you know they'd probably be glad to go out and have another Bible study with you again. It's just a matter of if you want help, we'll help. But you know I I, I enjoy smoking and I enjoy drinking my coffee. And I enjoy eating my snacks. Well, I'm not saying, I mean, the the, the, the smoking is definitely, you know, harmful to your body. Uh, uh, other things, you know, the snacks and things like that, that's in, in moderation. Those aren't necessarily sinful unless you give in to them. Paul said, I would not be uh, brought under the power of anything. So I think if, you know, people say, i got to have my, cup of coffee in the morning and things like that you know if that's if that's their addiction then that's no different than smoking the cigarettes it's it's being under the power of that so uh, but but I'm saying well, I'm, a, first, I, I, first I'm under the power of cigarettes that's for sure okay. I read my bible and listen to you all on TV but I light up two or three cigarettes during the time you're on TV and sometimes when I'm reading my bible I do lay, lay, lay it down and reach and get a cigarette. And after I finish my cigarette, I go back to my Bible. So, yes, I'm working on getting better. Well, and, that's what I'm saying, ma'am. We, we need to help you obey the gospel, and then we can take care of a lot of these other things, too. So I'm saying? It's kind of, it's kind of like let's, let's, get the, let's make sure the horse is in front of the cart instead of getting the cart before the horse. Uh, yes, sir. You know, the the Bible can help you take care of a lot of things, but you got to take care of the the uh, the big thing first. First thing to worry about is your soul. Then we can work on the other things. Can I can I put you on hold and get your name and and phone number just so I can have a contact and then uh, make sure that we can stay in touch. I would love to do that. Okay, All right, I'm gonna put you on hold and. And Mark is sitting in here. He'll get your name and name and phone number, okay? Okay. All right. Thank you for your call. Thank you. All right. Well, there we go, friends. So sin, and that's what sin does. You know, I appreciate the lady calling. <clears throat> but that's what sin does. Sin puts you in a seat, and then it makes it very, very hard to get out of that seat. It makes it very, very hard because... That's the addictive nature of sin. So, because this is what the Bible describes sin as. Sin's a snare. It's a snare. In uh, 2 Timothy 2, in verse 26, notice this. 2 Timothy 2, in verse 26, Paul said, he, he's talking about, well, let's, back, let's go up a few verses here. <clears throat> the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Now, that's really what we're talking about. Individuals that are opposed themselves, they're, they're their own worst enemy. He says, if God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, if, they'll, if they will repent, God will certainly forgive them. If they will repent after knowing the truth and that they may recover themselves, out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. See what the devil does? The devil gets you tied up in sin, and then and then he comes back and says, Well, you trying to get out of it? You're trying to get out of the chair? You sit back down. He'll put you right back down in in your place. <clears throat> because he's got a hold on you. He got he got the snare on you. And so, uh that, that's the way sin works. It's optional. You know, well, I can, I can quit any time. But then it starts overpowering. It starts overpowering. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14. 2 Peter 2 and verse 14. 
having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. Now this is where, this is the, the end result. Eyes full of adultery. Every time, every time a guy sees a woman, he's always thinking about adulterous thoughts or fornication. You know, that's every, every time he's th that's, that's what he sees. Why? His eyes are full of it. That cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, coarse children, cursed, cursed children which have forsaken uh, the right way and are uh, gone astray, following the ways of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. There you go, friends. That's, that's the way sin works. It gets you to the point that everything you, <clears throat> everything you see, everything you talk about, it's all, that, that's what it comes right around to. That's why you, you're around these people that are always coarse jesting and joking and carrying on and it's like everything out of their mouth, every other thing out of their mouth is a curse word or a vulgar word. Why? Because that's what they've practiced. That's what they've practiced and they probably heard it growing up. You know, mama said it, daddy said it, everybody said it and so as they grow up they start saying it. And it's just second nature to them. Sin is entangling their soul. So that's where they're sitting. That's where they're sitting. Uh, look at Proverbs 5, verse 22 and 23. Proverbs 5, verses 22 and 23. <clears throat> I really want to move on. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. Now look at that. Satan gets you tangled up in sin, and he gets you to tie your own self up. He shall, he shall die without instruction, and the greatness of his folly, and with the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. <clears throat> Friends, that's exactly how sin works, and that's why, that's why society wants to redefine sin. You know, society wants to redefine sin. Well, marriage is 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 two men and two women, and now, uh, you know. Pedophilia. They want to redefine pedophilia. It's not, you know, it's not unnatural. It's not wrong. It's not a disorder. Homosexuality is not a disorder. Let's redefine it. Let's make it something that sounds good or let's make it okay by redefining it. No, friends, it's still a sin. <clears throat> it's still a sin. So that's how, that's how it works. Sin ensnares you. Sin makes you think that you have a good seat. Makes you think you have a good seat, but really, you're not even in the stadium, friends. You think about that. You think you're in a good seat, you're in a good place, and really, you're not even in the stadium. You you're outside in the parking lot. You know, you're sitting in the back of your back of your truck tailgate partying, and you boy, I, I got a good seat. You can't even see the game. You're not even in the stadium. Now, friends, this is why I'm saying you're outside looking in. Spiritually speaking, you are outside looking in, and yet you think, because the devil, this is the way the devil works, he's got you thinking you're okay. Look at this, Ephesians 2 and verse 12. Ephesians 2 and verse 12. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of Strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's where you are. You're outside of Christ. You're outside. Now, this is my point, friends. You think you're in a good seat, but really you're sitting outside. Now, if someone said, I want to get you to a better seat, I can, what if someone said, I can just get you in the gate. I can get you in the stadium. You know what, friends? That's a better seat, a nosebleed seat. In the stadium is better than sitting outside the stadium wishing you were in. Get it? I would think it is. <clears throat> when our when our Baptist neighbors tell us, you know, uh, uh, you know, when they talk about uh, you you won't sin against God because you don't want to sin against God. Well, listen, if once saved, always saved is true, 
and I can do whatever I want to and still get to heaven, I'll take the dirtiest, darkest corner of heaven as long as I'm in heaven. Well, that's the way sin works. Sin gets you to think that, well, hey, I, I can, I, I'm in the stadium. No, you're not, friends. But I can get you a better seat. I can tell you how to get a better seat. Here it is. Get the best seating available. Here's the best seating. In Ephesians 2 and verse 6, Ephesians 2 and verse 6. Look where Paul said. Now, he, remember, he's in verse 2, he says, You were sitting up here in sin. <coughs> but he says, But he hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's a better seat, isn't it? You've gone from sitting in sin to sitting with the Savior. You're going from outside the stadium to inside with Christ. Now, that's a better seat. And it's a better seat because God is the usher. God is the one directing you there. Listen, Paul said we're made alive. We're raised up just as Christ was. Friends, only God can raise up someone from the dead. Only God can forgive sins. Only God can raise up someone from the dead. That's why Jesus in Mark 2, Mark 2 verse 9 and 10, the, the man uh, that was uh, lame with a palsy, he said, take up thy bed and walk. Actually, he said, thy sins are forgiven you. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they said, wait a minute, only, only God can forgive sins. Jesus said, well, what's it easier to do? Say, your sins are forgiven or take up thy bed and walk. Both of them have to be done by the power of God. He says, so that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. I say to the man who's lame, take up thy bed and walk. Now God is the one who can make you rise up out of sin and set you in heavenly places. The same way that he did for his son Jesus. I want you to look at this. In Revelation 1, 18. Revelation 1 and verse 18. <clears throat> Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead. He said, I was dead. That's the word became. He said, I became dead. I became dead. Well, in John 10, why did, how did he become dead? John 10, 17. John 10, 17, he said, No man, therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. And I have power, uh, and I have power to take it, uh, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received my father. He became dead. He willingly became dead. But it was the father who raised him up brought him back to life. Now, God raised him up. Romans 1 verse 4. Now, look at this. Romans 1 verse 4. God raised him up. He declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. If Christ was not the holy, pure Son of God, he would not have been raised, raised from the dead. If he was not the sinless Son of God, he would not have been raised from the dead. But the power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that can raise you and me from the dead. That's the power that can raise the dead up. Look at this. Colossians 2, verse 11. Colossians 2, 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins, uh, putting off the, the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Well, that sounds like what Paul said in Ephesians 2. You're dead in your sins. 
but God raised you up. How did he raise you up? Well, through an operation. Through an operation. When you were buried with Christ, God operated on you, removed the sins of your flesh. He removed your sins and then raised you up to newness of life. Romans 6, verses 3 through 5. You die with him in baptism, you're buried with him in baptism, and you're raised again from baptism by the same power that raised up Christ from the dead. Remember what Christ said? He said the same power that can say forgive sins is the same power that can say uh, take up thy bed or raise up the dead. The same power that raises up the dead is the same power that forgives sins. God raised up Christ from the dead, and God used that same power to raise you up and forgive your sins. Now, that is when He puts you. That is when He puts you in a better seat. That's when He puts you in a better seat. So, what price are you willing to pay for a better seat? What price are you willing to pay for a better seat? A seat in Christ. A seat that's now in Christ. In the church that Christ paid for with his blood. What price are you willing to pay for a seat with Christ in heavenly places where all spiritual blessings are? Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Look what comes with it. Here's all the perks that come with this heavenly seat. Blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The same place where Paul says we are sitting is in Christ. Ephesians 2 and verse 6. He hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So when you're in Christ, you're in a heavenly place, a better seat, and you have all these blessings. What would you pay for that? What would you pay for that? Look, there's people that are willing to pay $20,000 for a 50-yard line seat in the Super Bowl. Now, they're willing to pay big bucks for a three- or four-hour-long football game. They're willing to fight the crowds to go in and fight the crowds going back home in order to watch a ball game, and they're willing to pay $20,000 for that experience. What will you pay for for the best seat in the house? For a seat in Christ, what would you pay for it? You know what Jesus said in Luke 14, 27? He said, whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and count the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it? You need to count the cost. What is it worth? To get that good seat. To move, to move from the seat of sin to now sit in a seat with Christ in heavenly places. Look, we're not, you're not, we're not talking about 50-yard line seat. We're talking about the luxury suite. We're talking about the luxury suite. Press box. Right? Press box. We're talking about all backstage passes, whatever. That's what we're talking about. That's the best seat in the house, friends. What's it going to cost? Well, what are you going? What are you going to willing to pay for it? You know what? All it's going to take is for you to humble yourself before God and say, "I want to obey the gospel. I want to be a child of God. I want to be in Christ. I'm willing to do what it takes to render obedience to Christ in order to have that good seat with Him." You're invited. You're invited. It, it's, you know, it's, it's not like you're standing outside the stadium and now you're going to have to pay the big bucks. Oh, you have to pay a price. You got to give up some things in the world. You may have to cut out the drinking. <clears throat> no, you ain't no way to it. You will. You have to cut out the drinking. Can't be gambling, running to women, forn fornicating, shacking up. Can't be doing all that. But you know what, friends? You need to consider that the price that you'll pay for not going in the price that you pay for not going in will be a whole lot more than the price you'll pay for going in. 
See, it's not like the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl, you can save a lot of money by not going in. I'm going to save a whole bunch of money this Sunday by not traveling out to San Francisco and going to the Super Bowl. But you know what? It's just the opposite when it comes to the church. You you may pay a, you may pay a little bit to go in. It may cost you some friendships, maybe maybe even some relationships with your family. Maybe you have to get out of a out of a bad marriage, a marriage that you're not that you shouldn't be in. Maybe you're married to a man that's not your husband. That can't be your husband. Or maybe you're married to a woman that can't be your wife. <clears throat> Are you gonna pay that price? Because if you don't go in, if you don't become a member of the Lord's church, you're not added to the body of Christ. The price you're going to pay is your soul. And Jesus said, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What is man profit? You gain the whole world and lose your soul. Friends, we're telling you how to get a better seed. You're sitting in sin. You're sitting in sin. You're outside of Christ. You're in a man-made church or you're caught up in, in worldliness the lust of flesh and desires of this life. But we're telling you how to get a better seed. A better seed that's in Christ. So the question is, will you? Will you take that invitation? The invitation is, whosoever will, whosoever will humble himself as a little child shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. The spirit and the bride say come. Here's the spirit. The spirit is the word of God. It calls. The invitation is extended. And the bride is the body of Christ. Members of the Lord's church putting this TV program on for you so that you can have the opportunity to hear the invitation. Will you Will you choose a better seat? That's what it really gets down to. Will you choose a better seat? Friend, if we can help you, we want to do that very thing. Again, my contact information is 276-340-2653. We're out of time. But if we can assist you in any way in moving to a better seat, we want to do that very thing. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily